Welcome to the fourth season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you are a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. It is interesting how sometimes two worlds can collide and lead to a tragic outcome no one saw coming. In 2002, Leon Jacob met and married Annie, and the couple had two sons. Leon had dreams of becoming a doctor. He attended medical school in the Caribbean and graduated in 2005. Back in the U.S., Jacob entered surgical training in a number of residency programs at different hospitals, but was repeatedly dismissed. ABC News reported that he entered another residency program in Ohio, but his superior there found he lacked medical knowledge and had lied about a patient's care and terminated him. Jacob broke into the home of the hospital administrator and was arrested. He pled guilty to criminal trespass. Over the years, their marriage had many highs and lows, and after 11 years, Annie finally called it quits and filed for divorce. But Leon wasn't ready to part ways and sent her harassing and threatening texts and emails. Annie eventually pressed charges against her ex for intimidation and aggravated stalking. Leon responded that her claims were overstated and pled guilty to attempted cyber harassment and served probation on the stalking charge. All other charges were dismissed. Court records reveal that after his divorce, Leon met Megan Varakis in Pittsburgh and the two began dating. After a while, he convinced her to move back to his hometown of Houston, Texas, where he presented himself as a doctor and worked out of his home. In 2016, Leon was having trouble financially and filed for bankruptcy. Meanwhile, also in Houston, Valerie was confident and smart. She was popular and well-liked in high school. She attended university and became a veterinarian. The animal doctor was friendly and compassionate and liked by her clients. Valerie met Mac McDaniel, a fellow veterinarian. They married, had a daughter, and outwardly built a great life. They amassed many assets, including their home in an upscale neighborhood, and spent their weekends at their Cheeky Island vacation house. They drove new fancy cars and owned a boat. But Valerie came to find out that Mac had been careless with his spending and was depleting their marital assets, and they were facing foreclosure on their home. After 17 years of marriage, she filed for divorce and hired her neighbor a divorce lawyer to represent her. Valerie took out a $1.2 million loan to buy Mac out of their veterinary clinic. Living in a two-bedroom condo, Valerie shared custody of their daughter. While working with her lawyer, Valerie met her son Leon, who was nine years younger than her. Leon still had the looks of a playboy. At first, his attitude repulsed her, but then she found herself drawn to him. In January 2017, Leon and Megan had a fight, and Leon assaulted Megan. She called police. Leon admitted that he'd put his hand over her mouth. Megan moved out. Leon's eyes started to wander, and he started seeing Valerie. Things moved quickly. Within weeks, he'd moved into her condo, and they were talking about marriage. Even though Leon was seeing Valerie, he was still trying to win back Megan. 
The Houston Chronicle reported that he sent her an email a few weeks later telling her that he loved her and that he was making $30,000 a month, and he wrote, I told you I would get back on top. It's time all the craziness stops and we can get back to life together. But then history repeated itself and Leon began harassing her. Megan complained to police several times that he was threatening and stalking her. Leon was charged with assault and stalking. A local bondsman by the name of Felix Kiabosch provided bond, and Leon was released from jail. He still had dreams of getting his medical license and knew the charges would hurt his chances. So he sought help. He contacted an employee at a law firm and asked her to help him win back Megan. And if that didn't work, he suggested two options. That she convinced Megan to leave town, and that if she refused, he wanted the employee to arrange for someone to grab Megan and bring her to him. And he suggested that he had a syringe of potassium chloride that could take care of the rest. The employee refused to help Leon, but did provide him with the name of Zack, who was served in the military and received a Purple Heart. Leon contacted Zack so that he could try to convince Megan to drop the criminal case against him. And if that wasn't successful, he wanted Zack to make her disappear. Leon paid Zack with $5,000 cash, two designer watches, and a laptop. Zack took the payment, then disappeared. Desperate, Leon went back to Felix and told him what happened and that he needed Megan gone. Felix had heard a lot in his career, but Leon made him nervous, so he contacted police. During her eight-week relationship with Leon, Valerie became isolated from her friends. Leon focused his anger towards Mac and his treatment of Valerie. At some point, Valerie joined him in thinking Mac also needed to disappear. Valerie was no longer seeing many of her friends. Then one of them started receiving vulgar texts from Valerie's phone about Mac. But her friends suspected that Leon was the one actually sending the texts. After Felix's call, police whisked Megan away to a safe house and tracked down Zack, who confirmed what Leon had hired him to do. They convinced Zack to become a confidential informant. Police needed evidence and brought in undercover Officer Javier, who would pose as a hitman. Zack arranged a phone call and a meeting between Leon and Javier so that they could get audio and video evidence. In their phone call, Javier was taken by surprise when Leon asked if both issues would be taken care of. That's when police learned that Leon also wanted Valerie's ex-husband, Mac, taken care of. Leon claimed that Mac was a terrible person and then he tried to take their daughter away from Valerie. Although the meeting was arranged with Leon, Valerie tagged along. Speaking with Javier, she confirmed their intentions, saying she wanted Mac to be killed, and provided his personal details, his address, and the type of car he drove. Xavier told her it would be another $10,000 to include Mac, and she responded, that she would find the money, but may need to pay in installments. Then police let Mac know what Leon and Valerie had planned. They arranged with both Mac and Megan to pose for photos to make it appear they had been killed. Mac stepped the stage to look like he'd been carjacked, then murdered wearing sunglasses and dressed in a blue shirt. His body slumped forward, resting on the steering wheel with a fake bullet wound to his left temple. 
For Megan, she was dressed in a grey suit. Sitting in a warehouse, long white sap straps were pulled tight around her ankles and wrists. Duct tape was placed over her mouth and wound around her head, trapping her long blonde hair. Her eyes gazed down and she looked distraught. On March 11, Javier called Leon to tell him he had some news. He invited him to stop by Valerie's condo. Upon arriving, Javier was shocked when Valerie gave him a hug and kissed him on the cheek. Javier offered to show Leon a photo of Mac, but he declined. Leon handed him $1,800 as partial payment. Later that night, Javier called Leon to say Megan was dead as well. Then officers continued with the charade. Just after midnight, they knocked on Valerie's door. Her daughter was asleep just down the hallway. With body cameras on their uniform, they were ready to capture Valerie and Leon's reaction to the news. The couple appeared to be shocked. Them of our officers could even ask where they'd been that night. Leon offered up an alibi. Officers had enough evidence and arrested Valerie and Leon. Imagine the shock when she saw her ex-husband Mac, alive and well, standing in the hallway, ready to pick up his daughter. Leon and Valerie appeared in court, their wrists bound by handcuffs, both dressed in jail-issued orange shirts and pants. Valerie's had county jail emblazoned across her chest. Both pled not guilty. Three days later, Valor is released on a $50,000 bond. Her veterinary license was suspended. She returned to her condo and kept to herself, spending time writing on her tablet. She wrote letters to her family members and sealed them in envelopes. Then on March 27th, 16 days after her arrest, she penned one last note before leaping off the balcony of her seventh-floor condo. Valerie died by suicide at 48. In March 2018, a year after his arrest, Leon went on trial. Dressed in a dark suit with a white shirt and tie, his hair had receded and he wore black framed glasses. As he sat at the defense table, he leaned back, ever so slightly, appearing arrogant. His lawyer argued that Leon thought he was hiring a private investigator to help him win back Megan, and that he was not hiring a hitman. When Leon took the witness stand in his own defense, and the prosecution confronted him with the facts, he waved them off, saying, If that's what you say... On the stand, he told the jurors that his survival was the most important thing to him. Yet, in the recordings the prosecution played in court, they heard him say that he didn't want anyone to be harmed. But in his next breath, he said that if it gets to that, that's okay. Annie took the stand against her ex-husband and testified as to his behavior, and it was apparent to the jurors that Leon had a pattern. The jury didn't buy his excuses, and after only two hours of deliberation, found him guilty on both counts of solicitation of capital murder and sentenced him to life in prison and ordered him to pay a $10,000 fine. At his sentencing, Megan read her victim impact statement. Wearing a light gray suit jacket, she appeared nervous but confident as she strode to the stand. Leaning into the microphone, with defiance in her voice, she glanced at Leon and clearly stated, You convinced me to leave my life I had in Pittsburgh and leave my family. I believe everything happens for a reason. 
While you sit in jail, I hope you think of me. The girl that you call poor and uneducated. Because it's because of me. You will be imprisoned for life. You will never see your children go up. You will not be part of their lives. And they will be better for it. I think some part of me always knew that you would try to hurt me. That you were always lying. You destroyed me financially and took away my sense of security. But you can do that no more. Enjoy life in prison. Well said, Megan. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Paul Gruber. He traveled the world, and after he retired, he settled into a home on Muskrat Lake in Idaho. He hired Daryl, a handyman, down on his luck, but Daryl became consumed with envy and greed, and Paul ended up buried four feet under. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murderin20.com. We'd like to acknowledge Verbal Planet for use of their music, sound effect from Vaseline Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.